Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today in the Mercury Library with Hector Balderas, New Mexico State Auditor since 2006 and re-elected in 2010, and who is now a candidate for Attorney General in New Mexico this November. A native of Wagon Mound, New Mexico, in Mora County, Hector served as a state representative from 2004 to 2006. He's the first person from Wagon Mound to earn a JD degree, graduating from the UNM Law School in 2001. He's also served as an assistant district attorney in Bernalillo County and is well known as a straight arrow in New Mexico. So I'm really happy to have you with us. I appreciate you having me here and uh, look forward to a, a candid conversation with you and the rest of New Mexico. So everybody um, who watches the Mercury is probably uh, more informed about state government than most people, I would think. But uh, we're still a little bit uh, sort of puzzled and mystified by the Office of State Auditor and, and a number of other offices, too. So I'd love it if you would to kind of explain what, what the state auditor does, and you've been doing it for eight years now, and also to try to give us um, a clue as to why the governor would have chosen an outside auditor to audit behavioral health uh, institutions in New Mexico and not use the state auditor's office. When I was campaigning for the office initially, it was probably the first public policy challenge that we recognized immediately, which is citizens didn't know who the state auditor was. And more importantly, and uh, probably the larger risk to society is that no one understood what the state auditor did. And um, immediately we set out, not only in the campaign, but immediately upon becoming auditor, to change the culture, change the expectations, and really talk about how important the auditor is in the daily lives of New Mexicans. Plainly put, uh, at the coffee shop, whether it was Raton or Deming, um, the legislature basically writes the check. The governor uh, will take the five or six billion dollars on any given year and spend that check. Uh, and then it's my job to go and account uh, for the citizen taxpayer dollars that the legislature and the governor uh, have uh, expended on the behalf of the citizens. Everyone understands that role, but they didn't understand that it was the auditor's function to really deliver that type of accountability. And then finally, the one of the things that we implemented that was already built into the Constitution and into the state law was my ability to intervene on behalf of any citizen. So upon any crisis, whether it's fiscal mismanagement, whether it's a local schoolhouse, a district attorney, uh, it could be as high a, an office as the governor's office. If there was some allegation of waste, fraud, or abuse, uh, I built a unit and a division to be able to go in on behalf of the citizens, uh, figure out what happened, and properly account and tell the truth about those occurrences. And so we really have transformed that office. Uh, so now more than ever, citizens understand who I am. They sometimes refer to me as a bald guy in a coffee shop. But ultimately, they do know that it's my job to step in on their behalf. And so we're really proud of that legacy. So I really wasn't aware that, that the state auditor could actually step in and, uh, and act as a kind of a, um, uh, the eyes and ears of the citizens in terms of, of uh, misdealings or chicanery. And stuff. Could you give us some examples of that? Once we realized that we had that authority in law and once we realized the dramatic need all across every corner of the state, uh, once um, that was in place, uh, for the first time in the history of New Mexico, we began to get dynamic calls from all over New Mexico. And the biggest case uh, that really broke open the story of the Office of the State Auditor was the Hemis Mountain School embezzlement case, where right. we had small-town citizens calling all levels of bureaucracy, and no one would listen. And they suspected that someone was stealing from that little poor school in Rio Riba County. When I went up there, uh, me and my general counsel, we assessed risk, we looked at some uh, compliance issues and immediately determined that at that point this was going to be one of the worst embezzlements in the history of New Mexico. What ended up uh, coming out of that investigation was a $3.4 million embezzlement by a public employee. Oh and uh, we ended up working with the district attorney. I even ended up fighting with the district attorney because I thought that she had under-indicted 
and uh, didn't send a strong enough message uh, from really stealing from one of the most sacred public institutions in New Mexico. But that was one of the first initial examples. Another area or another case that we were uh, made a lot of headlines, even on Fox News, was the first ever takeover of municipal government in Sunland Park. That was our case oh, where right. we hit the border and uh, we made the governor essentially take over that municipality once we determined there was massive abuse of public dollars. I mean, even involving uh, shenanigans of um, both um, the use of a stripper and public funds and hiring an investigator to out one mayoral candidate versus another. It turned into a real circus. So from that to even the case where at the Finance Authority, which is basically the People's Bank to finance water projects and roads, we discovered that one of the public employees had doctored a fake audit. And at the Finance Authority, uh, that led to numerous reforms. So a lot of these cases were cases where we got tips or complaints, and then we had to take a unit and step in and take over those agencies temporarily uh, and take them to corrective action. So if we could, let's go back to the behavioral health thing just for a second. Why, why would some, why would you, why would, why would a governor go to an outside auditor? I mean, it seems obvious because you want it to turn out a certain way, but, but, but was that legal? I mean, is that, is that appropriate? Is it appropriate legislatively? Is it a, is it a break with tradition? And what, how is one supposed to look at that? Well, generally, the state agency uh, themselves contracts um, Medicaid auditors um, to do random and annual audits. Okay. So this was not um, necessarily a rarity. What was a rarity is that we discovered that um, behavioral health, uh, HSD specifically, has what's called a quality control unit. And once that audit had been completed, should have run that audit uh, through that quality control unit so that they could review the findings and the conclusions. Mm -hmm. That was where the, um, the break in process occurred, and, uh, and that was the abnorm abnormality. Um, another concern that I have, though, is that upon some type of allegation that there was uh, $36 million in fraud, that report should have been referred to my office. Uh -huh. for review and it was not and uh, we eventually uh, after requesting that report were denied the report by the secretary um, and then we even had to subpoena that report and go all the way to the district court of which the district court agreed with our position that it was a violation of law for the secretary or the governor to withhold any audit report uh, that was conducted on behalf of citizens of New Mexico so we are the subject matter expert in qualifying audit firms, making sure that they have the appropriate uh, skills and staff. And so it wasn't inappropriate. An, an, an agency can get their own audit firm. What's inappropriate is when they don't return the report or provide the report to us so that we can review it uh, under state law. And that really was where, uh, regrettably, uh, our office and the administration and even the Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, was forced to be subpoenaed to produce that report to me when they should have just complied with the law and been more transparent. So have you completed your uh, your analysis of that audit now? We have com concluded um, the financial audit for the whole agency uh -huh. and uh, what we determined was that they did not follow their process. We also determined that there was overbilling and concerned, uh, concerns concerning uh, practices with the new providers that have come in from Arizona. And ultimately, uh, while we can't comment on the initial audit report that is still under um, confidentiality due to General uh, Attorney General Gary King and an agreement with the Secretary of Health and Human Services, we have provided our findings and concerns to the Inspector General um, of Health and Human Services in Washington, D.C., we have received feedback from them already that they're going to be collaborating with us uh, for additional investigation and review of that agency. Really? So that is a big development recently um, because they took our position that there are some concerning uh, processes that were not followed and that, quite frankly, New Mexico could have done a better job in managing those behavioral health dollars.
One last question about this. Are you auditing now or, or examining now the Arizona companies? We are no longer uh, reviewing those transactions. Uh, we've concluded our review uh, of the last uh, year and the referrals that we received from the New Mexico legislature. However, there is an annual upcoming audit which we've directed the next audit firm to um, uh, continually look at some of these older findings and see if there's been any uh, remarkable improvement. One of the big controversies that we've been following for a long time is this is this Racino thing and I, and I know that you've been examining that very closely and uh, you came out with a report I'd like you to explain what you found and, and uh, what the implications are. Uh, we did complete the audit of the Racino. Uh, the Expo in New Mexico is really the state agency that was uh, required to provide proper administration and the awarding of this uh, controversial uh, Downs contract. Um, some of the concerns that we, we noted uh, first and foremost is that uh, as an oversight agency, as um, an agency that owes... Um, the duty to uphold the public trust, uh, Expo New Mexico is in severe, severe uh, condition for, um, you know, really it's been classified as a troubled agency. Wow. So when you're relying on a troubled agency to do the right thing and award a contract and make sure that New Mexico gets the best deal, already that raises a red flag that uh, is this the appropriate and proper agency to be evaluating and awarding uh, such a lucrative contract when, when New Mexico needs to make sure that they have their interests represented in the negotiation. The, the first issue that we noted was that, um, that they had already um, not selected or pre-selected the bidding and selection committee um, well after they had already um, went out to RFP, which is improper. Mm -hmm. So they should have put together a selection committee of trained professionals uh, with no uh, interest or ties uh, to the project and uh, made sure they had the most robust and fair and independent selection committee. Expo New Mexico didn't do that. They were, you could tell they were sloppy. Uh, they, had, they were so quick to put out the bid and yet weren't even concerned with uh, the selection committee. So that's a finding. Uh, another area that we noted was that um, the contract and the RFP were so complex, the auditor believed that 30 days was just not enough to evaluate competently proposals. And then finally, Expo New Mexico as an oversight agency, as an agency that needs to be independent, uh, is um, right now insolvent. They're um, owing several millions of dollars to the General Services Division. Um, and so there's a lot of risks uh, associated right now with Expo New Mexico and whether or not they can truly manage such a complex operation like the Downs uh, Casino. And uh, what we did upon the release of our report was we designated an at-risk notification and put all the lawmakers, uh, the governor, on notice that we were requiring Expo New Mexico to immediately take corrective action and continually monitor uh, and really test some of the performance terms uh, that were apparently negotiated in this awarding of the contract. So we've done a lot of work. Uh, my ultimate conclusion is that it could have been done in a much better, much more efficient manner. And regrettably, now we have threats of litigation, threats of controversy, and the cloud necessarily hasn't uh, quite been cleared. Yeah. But we are now shifting the burden back to the LFC at the legislature. We're shifting the burden back to the governor. And we're shifting the burden back to Expo New Mexico as a governing body mm -hmm. to make sure that they intervene and make sure that they uh, ensure that, that this agency takes proper corrective action. Because right now it is an agency that is very troubled. So is Ex Expo New Mexico something that you might um, uh, discover that you're having to deal with? If you become the attorney general, um... you know there could be various issues uh, that we have been monitoring as auditor that may carry over into uh, a potential attorney general um, term. Uh, one of the things I will take to the attorney general's office that has been a benefit to taxpayers is the use of oversight and accountability. I think the attorney general's office has authorities of oversight and responsibility over all state agencies. They basically are 
uh, government's lawyer. They are the attorney general will become the governor's lawyer. Right. And one of the areas that I want to make sure that uh, we at the attorney general's office focus on is that to make sure that government truly is accountable. Government be uh, uh, correcting themselves and policing themselves, and that involves changing a culture. That involves. Uh, being very transparent, and that also involves being able to identify what the proper law and criteria is and then making sure that someone is there to enforce and hold these agencies accountable. I'll give you a good example. There's um, Sometimes we will audit an issue such as the public education department mismanaging special education federal grants, and that's the debate that's going on right now where um, everyone is blaming different folks for us having uh, nearly $36 million shortfall in special education funds. Uh, it's the auditor's job to find those problems, but the attorney general could have a positive role in training public education department on what the proper compliance is with federal law. Uh -huh. uh, because right now they're resisting their responsibility when they say that uh, it's the federal government that somehow closed the door on these federal funds, that's simply not true. If you look at the law, every young student in New Mexico is guaranteed civil rights, and with those civil rights attach certain special education funds that guarantee that that student is going to learn in, in a very safe and healthy environment. It's up to public education department of the state of New Mexico to understand when it is timely that they need to submit those reimbursements back to the federal government. If the federal government says you didn't follow the grant or you didn't properly train the districts, uh, I hold our own state agencies accountable for that. But we would love to have an attorney general that could help train bureaucrats on what the proper legal responsibilities are that are owed to those students. Because I think that's what gets lost in the debate. Um, right now the governor is blaming the old governor for the loss of those federal funds. I'm more concerned by why those civil rights were violated for those special education students and who were the bureaucrats that didn't submit timely reimbursements that now uh, we as a state are having to request federal exceptions so that we don't lose those you know, multi-millions of dollars. And, and so that's how it all connects. But the attorney general, yes, I'm, a, I'm almost certain that there will be issues that I've discovered as auditor that we will somehow, as attorney general, whether it be litigation or training or enforcement, be wanting to step in and, and be a positive force for reform in New Mexico. Again, this is a, um, this is a question that I'm sure um, we all should know about, but we don't. Uh, how, how is the attorney general's office funded, and what's the chance for actually growing it and adding staff should should this kind of oversight role be expanded and, and uh... you know most of the attorney general budget is funded by the New Mexico legislature so there is ample opportunity I believe to, to introduce uh, new programs of oversight uh, that the legislature would consider uh, one of the ideas that I'm thinking about now is creating a public school safety task force so you have a lot of parents right now and citizens uh, they don't have a lot of answers, and they see these school shootings all over the country and now, of course, in Roswell. And the attorney general could play a very valuable oversight role in um, sharing intelligence, providing training, doing uh, risk assessments yeah. at school districts because, quite frankly, uh, school districts are looking for guidance and to do the right thing, and so are parents. And under the state law right now and under the jurisdiction of the Attorney General, the Attorney General has the ability to create a program, uh, identify an area of need, and really implement that. We would need some legislative dollars, but that's a good example where we can go to the legislature and ask for an increase in, a, in the budget. Another exciting opportunity for New Mexico is that the Attorney General also has an ability to kind of operate like an enterprise. If we stumble across a large settlement, uh, let's say we are having to uh, sue oil companies because they underpaid New Mexico in terms of royalties that they owed citizens in the past and they decide to settle. One of the settlement provisions could be that they, they create a fund for the Attorney General to 
provide adequate training or conservation training. Or so there's, uh, depending on the uh, challenge, the attorney general does have an ability to create enterprise funds. The tobacco settlement fund was a good example of that. That that in the past, New Mexico received a rather large settlement from tobacco companies for uh, lack of disclosure and health effects and um, and concerns that they were not being straight with the public. And uh, right now that funds some of the, the attorney general's office in terms of training and, uh, and, um, and, and educating some of our youth on some of the effects of tobacco. So th- I, I envision in the next four years, if I get the opportunity to serve, one of the um, areas of common good that the attorney general can can play a very valuable role is growing the pie of resources that can go to uh, vulnerable populations or populations that need um, training or some type of service that the attorney general can be responsible for. So I guess one of the things that's been sort of plaguing me is um, uh, presuming that the elections uh, 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 reelect we like the governor, which I, which I do not think is a foregone conclusion, uh, and presuming that you're elected, which I kind of do think is a, almost a foregone conclusion. Uh, what is the um, what is the nature of the relationship that an attorney general of one party has with a governor of the other? I mean, is it an evis- a politically adversarial relationship? One of the great things about New Mexico politics, even though I'm fairly new to it, I think I've been uh, in the political field, as they say, for about 10 years now. Uh, But one of the great things about New Mexico politics is I've had the opportunity to sit down with Paul Bardicke, a former attorney general, uh, former Governor Anaya, who was a former attorney general, and I posed the question to them, uh, is it harder to be an attorney general when there's a governor of the opposite party or of the same party. And interestingly, they both said that both present very uh, big challenges if, if, the, um, if the DNA for a, a healthy working relationship is not there. And I thought that was an interesting answer. Very interesting. Um, you know, the, a governor uh, of a particular party, even if it's your own party, could still potentially uh, not want an aggressive attorney general sure. Uh, telling him how to manage his agencies, or uh, the larger question, and, the, and probably the the question that I leave you with, and and the citizens of New Mexico is the most important doctrine that I have been thinking about as I think about an agenda for the attorney general. As I think about the needs of New Mexico, and I think about where we're at in the history of our state is uh, is the question of what truly is in the interest of the citizens of New Mexico. Because under the legal doctrine, uh, under state's interest, if I determine that the interest meets the level, uh, threshold level, that is, it is in the interest of the state of New Mexico, then I have a whole host of tools at my disposal in a toolbox, so to speak, uh, to make that a very central issue of my agenda. So let's say uh, we're talking one day about um, not enough students uh, in education receiving sufficient funding, and the governor and the legislature don't seem to have all the answers in figuring out that question. If I determine that it is in the state's interest of the people of New Mexico that sufficiency of funding in education be litigated, investigated, or reviewed, we almost could become the third or fourth branch of government that intervenes on that question. And so it's a very powerful doctrine that has rarely been used. um, And in the areas of water, uh, education, the economy, uh, I think that as as I study and I, I try to recruit the most talented legal minds in New Mexico, one of the things that I do want to do is to determine what what are the proper agenda points, what are the issues of our day that meet that state's interest doctrine, and then begin to use every tool that the Attorney General has uh, to really bring about improvements and outcomes. And that's an exciting role that I think probably what past governors were worried about uh, and what fed that tension. But, uh, you know, we're coming upon the Indian Gaming Compact negotiation. If I choose to be 
uh, an active attorney general, I would be working with the governor in determining what those balancing uh, points are. If, if, uh, if we ever want to improve child well-being in New Mexico, I would think that, uh, that we would have an aggressive say in whether or not the legislature and the governor are doing enough. So there are a whole host of issues that uh, fall under the state's interest doctrine and whether or not we have the staff and the will, the political will to take those issues on will be up to me. And, uh, and that's really what's exciting about the Attorney General's office. So I do think there should be a healthy tension, uh, but there should also be a healthy tension with the AG and the legislature. There should be a healthy tension with the AG and some of your, your most important finance and um, uh, fiduciary agencies like ERB, State Investment Council, uh, public lands. What are these agencies truly doing to maximize the public interest? The Attorney General should be looking at those agencies, making sure there's a proactive relationship, but that we're all moving in the right direction. So the 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 toolbox is full of tools at the AG's office, but I think the the potential and the opportunity are really unlimited and exciting. Well, I can see uh, the opportunity for a number of conversations in the future, mm -hmm. which I hope we'll have. And let me jump to two very pressing issues. Um, probably uh, the uh, lawsuit brought by Texas uh, against New Mexico over um, water drilling uh, near the Rio Grande will probably be in the courts for a very, very long time. And then uh, it has, as we know, a potentially disastrous impact on uh, on southeastern New Mexico agriculturalists. So, um, what what is your strategy in this? What what would you? How does one frame this? I mean, what do we do to win this thing? Uh, and and is it in the cards? Do you think? I mean, do we have a fair shot at this? You know, that is a that's a big question. <laughs> I think it's one of the. I I think it's one of the more. Uh, contemporary and biggest challenges in, that I've ever seen historically in New Mexico. Um, I don't think I have quick answers for, for that question. I can share a couple insights that I think I've come to a more solid um, uh, understanding that I do think are of immediate concern to me. The first is that uh, I believe that we have not built the proper capacity yet to evaluate the water issue. I think it's been very piecemeal. I think that our litigation right now is in a very reactive mode where it's probably really put us, I believe, at a disadvantage, and I want to change that immediately. And the first thing I'm going to do immediately as an attorney general is create a solicitor general position. Uh, we've never had one, and that would be basically like the number two attorney general, but that solicitor general would focus on going on offense and on, on some of the most important litigation issues. Uh, because while some days I'll be fighting crime, some days I'll be testifying on a bill, some days I'll be responding uh, to other issues, we should have a full-time solicitor general. New Mexico simply has, while it's a still a quiet place some days and a sleepy place, uh, the water issue is a good example where uh, Texas setting aside a hundred million dollars for litigation to me is a a battle cry, yes. and I don't think we have the infrastructure yet uh, to really try to take that on. And so, appointing a solicitor general to look at water litigation across the country, directing that solicitor general to tell me how uh, much we need in litigation resources is a question that needs to be posed to this person and. Uh, I think it would begin to bring a lot of clarity uh, to to that water issue. And do we have a chance? I'm not sure if we have a chance yet. Uh, I do know we're di we're too disjointed. All our interests, uh, Southern New Mexico farmers are worried, uh, but land grant community up in the Acequia area have different interests. And so I think we've unfortunately piecemealed um, um, this approach. Now the good news is it wasn't personal. We've piecemealed a lot of services and government uh, before. Uh, we really haven't had a good capital outlay infrastructure plan, which is why we have roads and bridges 
that are, are behind. Well, it's the same thing in, in our water litigation and in our, um, and in our creating a, a strategic water plan. We're just years behind. The second thing that I'm concerned about as an attorney general that um, I think uh, is a service that the AG's office can offer, uh, and I, 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 I reference the Jeff Bingaman report uh, on the New Mexico prison riot when there was mm -hmm. a, a tragedy in the early 80s on the prison riot. One of the roles that Jeff Bingaman, the former attorney general, played was that he went in and issued a report on what went wrong, what could be reformed so that the prison uh, riot would never occur again. And we as an attorney general's office have the ability to, um, to um, uh, doctor and to create a report uh, on the water issues in New Mexico. Mm. And that would be the second thing I would do besides the solicitor general is to uh, direct the staff to uh, try to create um, a threats and opportunities assessment, uh, first from litigation, but second, where are we going to end up, whether it is through conflicts of law, whether it is the effects on the economy, uh, whether it is pitting communities, and I see a lot of that right now. The city of Las Vegas uh, is pitted against the tribes and pueblos, and the tribes and pueblos are pitted against corporate America. and. And that type of dysfunction ne really needs to be addressed through uh, strong executive leadership. So I would hope to issue a report, an AG report, on what our strategic risks and threats are on the water situation and then begin to advise the legislature and the governor uh, accordingly. But we clearly have to go on offense with the water issue, and we clearly have to address the fear that citizens have from Silver City to Clayton that we're not only in a drought, but as you referenced earlier, it doesn't seem like there are easy answers. And uh, and nobody really is being held accountable for the lack of those answers. Oftentimes in New Mexico, the water questions have to do with quantity. Um, and uh, the quality issue is, is often put aside. Um, uh, we now know that probably the largest uh, jet fuel spill in the history of the United States happens to be up in the Ridgecrest area near Kirtland Air Force Base with... Um, probably uh, minimal monitoring, minimal testing, minimal analysis, minimal action. Uh, there's a lot of people who think this, this will have an enormous impact on the state. What can an attorney general do about, about such a thing? I did reference earlier uh, a reference to the fourth branch of government. Right. I think that uh, a lot of focus uh, sent, tends to um, uh, tilt toward the Congress. There's a lot of focus always on the courts and the Supreme Court. And, of course, um, there's always debate as to what the president and the governors are doing of respective uh, our states and, and the United States. I, I think that uh, your question uh, is one that is... Uh, one that is really being defined differently in each state, depending on who the AG is. But clearly, the Attorney General's office is becoming the fourth branch of government. Um, whether you see Attorney Generals from Florida suing Barack Obama over health care, whether you see AGs weighing in on uh, same-sex marriage, uh, or I've even seen AGs weighing in on how police should enforce or not enforce federal immigration policies and whether or not they're targeting minorities and in, in asking for federal papers. So I think that is going to happen here in New Mexico very quickly. And uh, the Kirtland spill is one classic example of where the Attorney General's office could be very proactive uh, with federal authorities. There's nothing to keep an Attorney General from requesting information from the federal government. Uh, there is nothing to keep an Attorney General from monitoring uh, whether or not those federal authorities and those state and local authorities are meeting their responsibilities. So as an enforcer, the AG can bring about uh, substantial oversight if they choose to weigh in on that issue, of course. Um, secondly, there are always potentially litigation options. Uh, it's not the first time a state has sued federal authorities uh, for either their overactive uh, intervention or their lack of intervention. And 
um, whether or not this kind of spill rises to that catastrophic uh, need for intervention is yet to be seen. But I would look at that issue in that type of context that uh, not does the attorney general have a responsibility to that issue. They clearly do. Uh, the question is how, how does the attorney general intervene and uh, develop a proactive responsibility in, in that cleanup? And I think there's a lot of opportunities where, where the attorney general uh, could get more information from those agencies, uh, could serve as an independent counsel uh, for a neighborhood association. I mean, a lot of, of things. It kind of depends on what, what the, the higher areas of need are in, in getting that spill cleaned up and getting the information to the right parties. But, but clearly the, the AG has a lot of tools uh, that they could use. So I guess that would also be a role of, of uh, a solicitor general as well, to just to examine that. Exactly. That whole picture. Um, as you know, we're, we're facing a bunch of terrible situations in Albuquerque with the police. Um, we, um, um, we don't need to re-rehearse re all of the numbers and, and all of the deaths, which are all all terrible tragedies for everybody involved. Um, one person's death spreads out to 100, 200 other people in the community. Uh, we have, um, we have, I believe, uh, with the exception of the Justice Department, which we still don't have any idea exactly how it's going to play out, we are kind of almost helpless here. We don't, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of fear. We don't feel like we're getting any help from the state. There is a terrible, terrible uh, chance that in a, a public demonstration somebody might get killed, um, which would cause a tremendous repercussion in our city. And a terrible. So what, um, what are the specific tools that an attorney general would have to uh, regulate a local police department? Could they pull the licenses or the certificates of officers who... Uh, who they feel are malfeasant. Uh, what uh, what is the power of the attorney general here, and what would you what would you bring to that in the future? Because I don't think this this problem is not going to not going to clear up this year. The it's interesting. The attorney general's office does play a role in the certification process. There is a board. Uh, the attorney general has many cases involving the certification or decertification of officers. Uh, throughout the state of New Mexico. And, um, you know, recently there have been some controversies just in the, uh, uh, in the administration of, of what I would consider low-risk cases. And, of course, now you're referencing the, the very uh, highly publicized and uh, very traumatic case that we've seen on TV play out that we're now nationally recognized um, for the, um, the shooting of the, um, uh, what I would consider a, a mentally, uh, challenged and, and someone who was needing behavioral health services, um, his, his unfortunate, uh, death was something that now Albuquerque is kind of symbolically incredibly known for. Uh, it's hard, I, it's hard for me to second guess, I guess, what, uh, what I would have done if I had already been an attorney general. Um, I can tell you that moving forward, uh, we have uh, we have to be involved in the uh, training uh, of law enforcement. Um, and it's not my it's not that I have a view against law enforcement. I think for the integrity of law enforcement agencies uh, across New Mexico, um, I, I think that police chiefs, uh, lo leaders in every community should want the attorney general involved in making sure there is a task force. Uh, anytime that there is a, a fatality, a, a, a police shooting that results in death, there should be a task force, an independent task force that's triggered uh, just to ensure that best practices were followed and that the, the process itself somehow wasn't tainted with some type of criminal act. 
as you can tell from today's press conference, one of the DOJ findings was that the internal affairs audit within the agency was not active enough and that there was not enough uh, external oversight over the police department, their training, their policies, and their procedures. And now if that is a finding uh, on behalf of the DOJ on the systemic agency, I can assure you that the Attorney General's office should be involved if there is a traumatic um, uh, fatality shooting that involves an officer. So uh, what it tells me is that the agency itself is just having trouble training officers uh, in terms of what is adequate uh, protection versus use of deadly force. And, and more importantly, I don't think they have an answer uh, beyond that so that when there is a fatality, I don't think there is an independent unit that can come in. It's either the D DOJ when things get really bad or nothing at all. And I think New Mexico can do much better than that. So one of the things we will we'll work with the legislature we will also make immediate recommendations um, on, um, on law enforcement agencies in New Mexico. Probably one of the first things we do in the first 90 days if we're elected is to weigh in. And my experience, I've been on both sides. I've done defense work and prosecution. Ironically, I was the sponsor of the custodial interrogation bill that required law enforcement to turn on cameras. Mm in 2004 and in that in that in 2004 there had only been two states that were 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 successful in passing the use of the lapel cameras uh, it was called the best evidence statute uh, myself who passed it in new mexico and law enforcement was resistant to me at the time they tried to describe it as anti-cop and i said no this will reduce litigation this will provide the best evidence for prosecutors to get convictions and ultimately will protect good cops who follow process and policy. Yeah. And they fought me on it. And ironically, uh, Mayor Barry and APD uh, were, were, um, were glad to up the use of cameras the last couple of years and get more resources for it. But years ago, that was a fight in the legislature. And the only other state that had passed it was Illinois at the time. Yeah because they had had so many problems with their death penalty and getting wrong confessions uh, with mentally challenged uh, individuals and defendants. And the, the guy that passed that bill at the time was Senator Barack Obama. So we were the only two in the country that were passing uh, legislation to bring about more transparency and best evidence in those processes. So reforming the criminal justice system, providing improved recommendations, uh, is a win-win for everyone, and I think that that's something that the, the AG's office will be heavily involved in um, providing better oversight and re rewriting the policies and procedures for law enforcement agencies in New Mexico. As the chief law enforcement officer, um, uh, everybody who who's ever sort of um, f followed these matters, nice to be on the ACLU board here, um, we know that county jails in New Mexico are medieval oftentimes at the very best. Losing keys, terrible fights, you can't get people to arraignments because they can't get out of jail. What is the, uh, is there a way for a state entity like the, like the Attorney General's office to manage county facilities like that? Perhaps manage is the wrong word, but oversee it and uh, require and indeed force some things to, to comply with the law? I think traditionally the Attorney General's office uh, stayed away from what I would call post-adjudication services. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have, if you look at uh, initially a citizen who decides to commit a crime and then they, they get investigated and then indicted, and that's the pre-indictment phase. And then if you uh, are, are lucky enough to have to go through the trauma of being in that system, um, that's a very complicated system, and the AG generally would stay out of those judicial matters. And then the question of jails is, a, is an interesting one because it clearly is post-adjudication, and I think the AG generally has focused on um, uh, the phase where crimes were either being investigated uh, or committed. And I think the the future of the AG's office 
in New Mexico uh, will greatly be determined by how well we answer uh, the question, are we truly getting smarter on crime? And so getting harder on crime and tougher penalties is something that has been exhaustively not only debated but implemented, and it's clearly not working. And so the AGs, the best AGs in the country are the ones that are engaged in looking at the society as a whole and saying, you know, are we truly fighting crime a smart way? And it leads you to looking at the other pieces in the puzzle, like the jails, because uh, as I've met with wardens, not only in prisons, but in jail facilities, um, those citizens um, end up coming back into the society and if somehow we don't uh, set or create a strategic plan and create unified accountability for and responsibility for uh, those in jail, we're simply passing the problem on to the next phase in the system. And so uh, I'm excited because, uh, you know, I have visited those facilities. I see how uh, the processes connect. And I think there's great opportunities. One example is that Bernalillo County right now is in litigation with the federal court, and it is simply because the civil rights of certain inmates uh, are being um, reviewed, and county officials are under this uh, decree, and it's costing the taxpayer a lot, a lot of money. And I, I believe, as an attorney general, that is an issue that I would be involved in in making sure the county is complying with the decree, but more importantly, trying to identify national solutions. I mean, why wouldn't I, as the attorney general that can fly around and can, can call upon the best legal minds and the, less, the, the best minds in the country, why wouldn't I convene a task force also to, to, uh, to, to put a stake in, um, in, in that big issue because simply what's happened is is they they are citizens that are going to be our problem anyway. If we don't pop properly engage, they're going to be part of the the challenge of New Mexico, uh, whether we like it or not. So I'm not a big fan of the compartmentalization of of departments and divisions. And so um, clearly, mo and and every warden I've talked to, and jail director and commissioner I've talked to, has welcomed the opportunity. Uh, to to really get smart on crime because the overcrowding, the 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 lack of addressing the systemic causes of of why people are committing crimes and and then why the rehabilitation is not working is something that I think we can uh, we can address much more uh, maturely than we have uh, than simply blaming another agency and passing the buck. So I. I hope to to maybe change the way we we govern at the AG's office, and I think that's an opportunity where uh, the risks are great, and we will have to play a large role in the prison and correctional systems of New Mexico. Well, this has been very informative. I've enjoyed it tremendously, and I hope we get a chance to talk in depth about a lot of other issues over the years. Thank you so much for being in the Mercury Library. It's been great to be here. I appreciate the opportunity, and uh, look forward. Uh, to many future conversations. Thank you.